so i uh, uh, welcome everybody and i request everybody to kindly mute their mics please so uh, today i have been asked to speak on radiographic evaluation of vertebral column in small animals uh, the presentation which i am giving i am using some pictures and resource material from uh, internet maybe some books and uh, these are solely for teaching purpose uh, most of the uh, radiographs uh, i have used from our uh, department also so uh, uh, about the vertebral column uh, the vertebral column in small animals has seven cervical 13 thoracic seven lumbar three sacral and 20 to 23 uh, coccygeal vertebrae the sacral vertebrae are fused now this is a, a standard uh, numbering of vertebrae uh, in dogs and cats it may vary a little bit uh, in cats um, but uh, there are seven cervical in almost all mammals uh, we all know and 13 thoracic seven lumbar and three uh, sacral so uh, when we evaluate the vertebral column uh, this is a radiograph of a, a lumbar vertebrae uh, we should evaluate six things uh, on for each segment let us say we are evaluating cervical or thoracic or lumbar or sacral or coccygeal we should keep in mind six things and we should evaluate the six things which i am going to tell you right now for each segment the first is we should always evaluate the length of the vertebrae so we should see the length of the vertebrae uh, i have shown you in uh, with arrows these are, this is the length of the vertebrae we should evaluate the length of adjacent vertebrae so uh, the length of adjacent vertebrae should be similar in case of accidents traumas the length of adjacent vertebrae can reduce or the vertebrae can get fractured and get impacted or become small in size so first thing we should evaluate is the length of adjacent vertebrae when i say adjacent means we should see one vertebrae ahead of it or cranial to it and one vertebrae behind it that means caudal to it the next thing we should evaluate is the the width of the adjacent intervertebral disc space now this space if if you see this space this space is the intervertebral disc space now here there is a disc intervertebral disc i will come to intervertebral intervertebral disc as we go along this is the intervertebral disc space so we should evaluate the width of adjacent intervertebral disc spaces these should be equal to each other that means there there should not be any reduction in intervertebral disc space uh, in a particular segment let us say if i we are seeing lumbar so adjacent intervertebral disc spaces should be same or similar the next thing we should evaluate is the vertebral end plates the arrows which are shown here these are the vertebral end plates that means the ends of the vertebra now these vertebral end plates should be nice and smooth there should not be any lysis when i say lysis means eating up of the end plates so there should not be any lysis of the end plates there should not be any irregularity mm -hmm. of the vertebral end plates uh, we should also see the body of the vertebrae the body of the vertebrae is uh, the whole vertebra which um, i can if you want i can just highlight it. so that is the body of the vertebrae so this body of the vertebrae should have smooth margins we should be able to see the body nicely there should not be any projections out of the body uh, i'll be discussing those things as we go along so we should evaluate the body of the vertebrae the vertebral end plates the next thing we should evaluate is the transverse process see these are the transverse process they are very faintly visible these are the transverse process these are very faintly visible but whatever is visible should be evaluated there should not be any fracture of the transverse process or uh, there should not be any lysis of the transverse process or any growth coming out from the transverse process so transverse process should be evaluated 
uh, very carefully when you are evaluating the vertebral column. Also, we should evaluate the dorsal spinous process. This is the dorsal spinous process, this one. Now, the dorsal spinous process is very small in lumbar, but in thoracic, when we see thoracic, you will see that the dorsal spinous process are very big. So the dorsal spinous processes should be evaluated for any lysis, any fractures, or any other abnormalities. So this is the uh, uh, third uh, thing. The next is the articular facets of the vertebra. Usually we bo don't bother to see these articular facets. These are the articular facets. So these articular facets should be evaluated to see if there is any uh, degenerative change or any periosteal reaction on these articular facets. So uh, this is a very important thing which we usually miss. So we should not miss these articular facets. Uh, they should be nice and smooth and uh, uh, curved in lumbar area. Then we should also evaluate the step up or step down of vertebrae. When I say step up or step down, means uh, see this is the these are the vertebral bodies. If I if I, I if I show you these are the vertebral bodies, right? These are the vertebral bodies. These are the vertebral bodies. Okay, uh, the spinal cord runs here. This this is where the spinal cord runs. So that is where the spinal cord runs. The upper margin of the spinal cord will be somewhere like this. The spinal cord runs like this. And these are the places from where the nerve roots arise. So they, these are the junctions from where the nerve roots arise. OK, so when we evaluate the vertebral column for step up or step down means this line, this particular line, I'll uh, show you with uh, another color, maybe. Maybe blue color, let me select this. So this particular line should be in a straight line. This should be in a straight line. That means a vertebra should not be, this vertebra should not go up or some vertebra cannot go down. The line should be straight. So if it goes up or down, that means step up of vertebra or step down of vertebra, that tells me that the vertebral column is subluxated or dislocated. So these are very important points which you should see for all segments, whether it is cervical, whether it is lumbar, whether it is thoracic, whatever. So you have to evaluate the six points one by one. Now we'll come to segment wise evaluation. So the first segment is the cervical vertebra. I told you there are seven cervical vertebra. The first cervical vertebra is also called as atlas. Now this is the atlas. This, are, this is the atlas. And these two parallel things which you see here, these are the wings of atlas. Now, wings of atlas basically are like this. They are two fork-like things in, into which the dense of axis fits. The dense of axis goes and fits into the wing of atlas. So this, this particular vertebra, this particular vertebra is the axis. This is the axis. Right, and this is the atlas. Now, if you see carefully, you will see that the atlas is having a shape of a plateau. So the uh, atlas is having a roof which looks like a plateau. Okay, flat surface, and the axis. You see, the axis is forming a a cap-like thing or a roof over the atlas. So at any point of time, at any given time, the axis or the dorsal spinous process of axis should cover the dorsal arch of atlas at any point of time. At least one third of the dorsal arch of atlas should be covered by the spinous process of axis. That means this and this should overlap with each other. This should overlap each other. Now. Even if the neck is bent to its fullest, still there should be overlap of atlas and 
axis. If the overlap is not there, the condition is called as or diagnosed as Atlanto axial subluxation. That is how you diagnose Atlanto axial subluxation. I'll, I'll show you a radiograph and we'll discuss that as we go along. So that is uh, the first uh, vertebra that is C1. That is the atlas. That is the C2. That is the axis. And then there are C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7. So there are seven cervical vertebrae. So we have to be uh, careful in evaluating these seven cervical vertebrae. Uh, another important point I want to add here is the uh, sixth cervical vertebrae has a very long spinous process, or uh, sorry, transverse process. So it juts downwards ventrally like this. So the sixth cervical, that is the identifying feature of the sixth cervical vertebrae. That is how I know that this is sixth cervical vertebrae. So you should be able to identify the sixth cervical vertebrae, that this is sixth. Automatically, you will be able to identify the fifth and the seventh. Now these four, three, C5, C6, C7 are very important cervical vertebrae because these are involved in wobbler syndrome. So we'll discuss that also as we go along. Uh, you see, uh, in cervical, the six points I have already told you. That means the body of the vertebrae, length of the body of the vertebrae, the width of the end plates, or the uh, this is the uh, sorry, the integrity of the end plates, the width of the uh, intervertebral disc space. This should be similar adjacent disc spaces. Uh, the atlanto axial subluxation. Uh, these are uh, the points which we have to evaluate for cervical vertebrae. So, so the six points which I told you earlier and the Atlanto axial sub subluxation point, that is uh, it should cover uh, the uh, dorsal arch of atlas, the spinous process of axis should cover the dorsal arch of atlas and the six cervical vertebrae will always have a ventral projection. Now why I am telling you this again and again is because this ventral projection of the sixth cervical vertebrae, this ventral projection, I have seen many people diagnosing this as foreign body. We get cases where uh, the dog is vomiting and uh, 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 the owner says that the dog has eaten a bone piece and you take a radiograph and you find that there is a bony piece here and we think that this is a foreign body. And we then do an endoscopy or do a surgery to try to remove this foreign body and we don't find anything. Basically, this is the transverse process of the C6, which goes down like that. So you have to be very careful in interpreting C6. So this is transverse process of C6. It will always jut down like that. That is how I recognize this is C6. So these are the important points in the cervical vertebrae. Now coming to the thoracic vertebrae. Now you see the dorsal spinous process of the thoracic vertebrae, how long they are. These are the dorsal spinous process of the thoracic vertebrae. Now in thoracic vertebrae, all the six points which we have already discussed, those six points are to be seen. Apart from those six points, the important points to note in thoracic vertebrae is that the ribs, each thoracic vertebrae will be having a pair of ribs. The ribs will always attach cranial to the thoracic vertebrae. So the first rib will attach cranial to T1. The second rib will attach cranial to T2. The third rib will attach cranial to T3 and so on. This is a very important point to identify which thoracic vertebrae is involved. So you should understand that ribs will always attach cranial to the particular uh, vertebra. So these are the thoracic vertebra. So this is T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, T7, and up to T13.
and then comes the lumbar. Now in thoracic vertebra, another important point to uh, remember is that just see the dorsal spinous process. These are the dorsal spinous process. You see that the th dorsal spinous th uh, process of thoracic vertebrae slant backwards. Just see how they are slanted backwards. They are slanting backwards. At T11, the, th the dorsal spinous process becomes at 90 degree. And then from T12 onwards, it starts slanting cranially. Now this T11 is called as the anticlinal vertebra because it has a straight dorsal spinous process. That is a very beautiful feature to evaluate or uh, identify that this is T11. If you know that T11 is anticlinal, you can evaluate or you can isolate that this is T11 and number the vertebra accordingly. So this is a very important feature. So in thoracic vertebrae, those six points which I have already told you in the beginning and the, the other two points to remember is anticlinal vertebra and uh, the ribs will always attach cranial to the corresponding vertebra. So these are the two important points for thoracic vertebra. Coming to the lumbar vertebrae, so these are the lumbar vertebrae. So the last thoracic, uh, just see this, the last rib goes and attaches cranial to the T13. So that is T13. So this is T13. Okay, so th this is first lumbar, second lumbar, third lumbar, fourth lumbar, fifth lumbar, sixth lumbar, and seventh lumbar. And then comes the sacrum. Sacrum is a fused uh, group of vertebra. Uh, whenever you see the lumbar vertebrae, the counting of the lumbar vertebrae should always start from L7. So you should count from L7 cranially. You should never count from L1, L2, L3, L4. You should count from L7, L6, L5, L4, L3, L2, L1, and so on. Now, why I'm saying that? Because uh, number one, L7 is e easy to identify. It is smaller than other lumbar vertebra. So L7 is always smaller than other lumbar vertebra. So don't think that this L7 is compressed, impacted. It is small. It is naturally small. For lumbar, we have to see that the L7 is always smaller than the other lumbar vertebrae, number one. Second is we should always count from backwards to forwards, that means caudal to cranial. The third is, if you see carefully, in lumbar, you see that they, you are, if you, you people have played chess, I hope that uh, you should be able to identify this, uh, this particular structure. This looks like a head of a horse. Right. This looks like a head of a horse. So I call it horse heads. These are horse heads. So you should be able to see the horse heads. This is very important point for lumbar vertebrae. I will tell you the significance of horse heads as we go along. So you should see this is the horse head. Now what is this horse head? Now this is the horse head tells me that this is the place from where the nerves arise. So I'll show you a picture. Now this is uh, a picture of the vertebral column. This is the gross picture and this is the uh, radiograph on the bottom. Just see this is the vertebra. So this is the vertebra. Here this is vertebra. This is the disc, intervertebral discs. This is the intervertebral disc. This is the nerve root which is arising. So this is the place from where the nerve root, roots arise. So the disc basically is composed of the outer fibrous ring and the inner nucleus pulposus. So nucleus pulposus basically is, you know, jam packed into the fibrous ring. It is, you know, packed with under very high pressure inside the fibrous ring. Now this disc basically acts as a shock absorber. Now, suppose the dog meets with an accident. Generally, disc will able to will be able to absorb the shock. But sub, suppose the accident is so you know huge or the trauma is so huge that the disc ruptures, it will rupture from the dorsal side. 
the most common site is dorsal rupture of the disc when it ruptures from the dorsal side the nucleus pulposa shoots up into the uh, this uh, spinal cord and pinches the spinal cord so the spinal cord is pinched up like this so once the nucleus pulposa shoots up this horse head will go the horse head will have fluid inside it because jelly of the nucleus pulposus has gone into the horse head so the horse head will no longer be seen clearly so if you are not able to see horse heads you should suspect that this could be a disc pro prolapse or disc protrusion this is a very important feature which i am telling you so uh, once the disc protrudes out another thing that will happen is the disc space intervertebral disc space will reduce so that these are the two important features to tell you that there is disc prolapse or disc protrusion the disc protrusion can be um, uh, hansen type 1 type 2 that you can read yourself the, those are not uh, uh, difficult if you want i can tell you at the end of the lecture so uh, this is how the disc protrudes and once it pinches the spinal cord the clinical signs or neurological signs start coming the dog will show paralysis uh, it could be uh, hind limb paralysis it could be both hind limb and fore limb paralysis or it could be um, uh, the whole uh, the dog may be recumbent totally it could be a flaccid paralysis it could be a um, uh, you know rigid paralysis and so on so uh, this is an example of atlanto axial subluxation now just see the dense the dense which was expected to be fit into this process or arches is has come up has come up and there is a gap between the roof of atlas and the spinous process of axis so there is an extreme angle here which has formed i told you the roof of atlas should be covered by dorsal spinous process of axis at all times if it is not covered the condition is atlanto axial subluxation this is a condition which is generally caused by trauma but and uh, it is seen in toy breed dogs very commonly and uh, over stretching of or over bending of neck can result in atlanto axial subluxation and clinically the dog will have severe pain in the neck and sometimes the dog will not be able to stand up will have a wobbly gait and so on so if it is a toy breed dog which comes to you with uh, a typical posture of head down or pain in the neck severe pain in the neck or is not able to balance or not able to walk properly you should take a radiograph a lateral view is sufficient to uh, diagnose atlanto axial subluxation uh, a, a vd view will also tell you that uh, there is a angulation of the neck at the level of atlas and axis so that is a very easy diagnosis atlanto axial subluxation then the next condition is hemi vertebra now hemi vertebra is a malformed vertebra it is a congenitally malformed vertebra generally hemi vertebrae are diagnosed when you are doing a chest radiograph or when you are taking a radiograph for pregnancy diagnosis or you are taking a radiograph for urolithiasis or uh, maybe a, um, you are taking a radiograph for some other condition maybe a foreign body incidentally you will find there are hemi vertebra what are hemi vertebra is the hemi vertebra are basically malformed vertebra you will find that the vertebra may be this like this or the vertebra may be like this or the vertebra may be smaller than the adjacent vertebra one vertebra may be small so all these abnormalities are hemi vertebra this is a very common feature in french bulldogs uh, uh, toy breeds basically pug you take a radiograph of pug in 50% of the pugs you will find funny shaped vertebra the vertebra will be abnormally shaped now these generally are diagnosed incidentally and generally they will not cause a problem but sometimes these can result in 
uh, problems the dog will not walk properly the dog will not uh, uh, may show uh, abnormalities like kyphosis scoliosis uh, lardosis and so on so uh, you should be able to diagnose hemivertebra and correlate with it with the clinical signs so if uh, you know a pug comes with such a picture such a radiograph i will say it is a hemivertebra no clinical signs everything is fine so i'll say just a hemivertebra incidental finding okay but suppose a dog comes to you with history of trauma and a vertebra is uh, you know small then i should consider it to be uh, impacted vertebra rather than a hemivertebra so hemivertebra are tricky to diagnose so you should always have your history of the patient with you when you are interpreting the uh, spinal uh, vertebral column uh, this is another example of hemivertebra just see this vertebra this is a very uh, triangular shaped vertebra there are more vertebra which are uh, abnormally shaped this will result to uh, in overcrowding of the ribs also sometimes so uh, you know uh, very common in pugs uh, french bulldogs and uh, small breeds miniature pinchers uh, culture palms you you may find this uh, uh, this particular abnormality it's okay if you if the dog is not showing any clinical sign don't worry about it um, these are all examples of hemivertebra just see this this dog this, this came for a pregnancy diagnosis uh, uh, and uh, we found that there are multiple hemivertebra so uh, just see this this also came for a pregnancy diagnosis and this was uh, multiple hemivertebra so uh, incidental findings uh, we need not worry about hemivertebra the next is condition is called as a block vertebra now block vertebra is fused vertebra when two vertebral bodies fuse together now just see this this is c1 so this is 1 this is 2 and 3 4 5 and 6 are block so c5 c6 are block here that means the vertebral bodies are fused together now when such fusion occurs it can be pathological secondary to maybe an infection maybe a uh, old infection a uh, fungal bacterial or it can be sec uh, a congenital problem so block vertebra again is a uh, abnormality which may be pathological which may be congenital so if it is pathological uh you know uh, you should have a history of uh, maybe a spinal uh, problem or the animal is not able to walk properly uh, maybe 2 years back or 3 years back or maybe uh, the dog was recommended for uh, some months and then treated with some antibiotics and all so these are common history which you will get if you find a block vertebra uh, block vertebra are usually associated with the uh, abnormalities like kyphosis kyphosis is uh, arch dorsal arch of arching of vertebral column or scoliosis sideward arching and so on this is another example of a block vertebra just see uh, this was an incidental finding we got uh, this uh, this, uh, uh, this 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 was a perineal hernia case of perineal hernia and this vertebra this this vertebra was block so we could easily diagnose this block vertebra 7 6 5 Four and three, four and three. L three and L four were block vertebra. So uh, such block vertebra should be evaluated carefully. And if the dog is showing clinical signs, to tell the owner that this is the clinical signs are due to the block vertebra. congenital malformations of vertebral column are uh, not uncommon and you can see such congenital malformation just see this uh, it looks like 
this vertebral body is dislocated. There is a step up of this vertebra, right? So if I count from here, seven, six, five, four, three. L three appears to be dorsally displaced, right? This this case came to us, and uh, uh, the history was not properly written on the form, unfortunately. And uh, I was doing the interpretation part, and I was in the X-ray room, and I interpreted this to be a dislocation, right? And then uh, the uh, when the owner took the uh, form or my report to the uh, OPD, they said that the dog is moving fine, running around fine. I went and saw the dog, and the dog was not showing even a single sign of uh, uh, the vertebral column uh, problem. The, the dog was running fine, moving around fine, and everything was okay. So these type of congenital malformations can come to you. So you should always correlate a finding with the history. If the dog is running around fine, moving around fine, then you should not state that this is, you know, uh, dislocation or there is no history of trauma. Nothing is there. You should always consider this to be a congenital malformation or maybe a hemi vertebra, which has uh, malformed like this. Then there is a, a condition called as transitional vertebra. So this usually we overlook it. Basically, uh, thoracic vertebra, how would we know that this is a thoracic vertebra? Thoracic vertebra are associated with ribs. I told you the ribs go and attach cranial to the at, uh, thoracic vertebra. So if a thoracic vertebra is not having a rib, that is transitional. So let us say that this is, I can't count. I don't know which is L7, right? So I can't count uh, which is this vertebra. So let us say that this is T13. Let us assume that this is T13. If this is T13, it should be associated with two ribs on either side. But here only one rib is there. The other rib is not there. So this is a transitional vertebra. Okay, let us assume that this is L1. I don't know, this could be L1 also. So let us say that this is L1. If this is L1, this should not have a rib. So this is transitional. So in any case, this is a transitional vertebra. So transitional vertebra is that vertebra which is showing a feature of other vertebra. So this is just a, you know, uh, incidental finding this will not be pathologically related to any condition you will the dog will not show any symptoms this this is very important finding to report on your uh, you know excel report uh, because these are important features in vetro legal cases uh, for example this just see this if you count from caudal to cranial l7 l6 l5 l4 l3 l2 l1 l1 is having a pair of ribs so this is a uh, transitional L1 vertebra. So we call it transitional L1 vertebra. That is how we know this is a transitional vertebra. Now this is a, a, a finding which you should report. We don't report it. So this, uh, we, uh, as a good radiologist, you should report this finding. Uh, this is another example, a beautiful example of transitional L1. So seven, six, five, four. 3, 2, and 1. This L1 is transitional. It is having a one, one rib. So that is how you know this is a transitional vertebra. The next condition is discospondylitis. Now from the name you can know this is involvement of disc and there is inflammation. Itis is inflammation and the disc is involved. So just see there, the vertebral end plates are eaten up. If you remember the six points I told you, go back and see the six points. Out of that, if you see the vertebral end plates, the end plates are eaten up. The end plates are showing lysis. That tells me that this is a discospondylitis. Now, discospondylitis is a problem uh, which is due to bacterial or fungal infections. So the dog, it was a very painful condition. The dog will you know, not be able to walk also sometimes, run with high fever. And uh, you will, if when you take a radiograph, you will see that uh, there is lysis of the vertebra. 
The confirmatory diagnosis is by evaluating the cerebrospinal fluid and uh, culturing it. Uh, it can be most common is the brucella, which can cause discospondylitis. Other reasons may be aspergillus, E. coli, staphylococcus, and also uh, aspergillus is uh, fungal can uh, lead to discospondylitis. Now, this is a very painful condition, let me tell you, and it will need antibiotics or antifungal treatment according to your requirement of the case. Uh, you just see there is a lysis here also. You see that fine lysis should be evaluated, should be diagnosed if you uh, if you want to. Sometimes only this this much lysis is only there. These these such big lesions will may not be there. There may be small lysis like this. So such small lysis also should be picked up by a radiologist and reported. This is another example of discospondylitis. Just see the end plates. There is lysis of the end plates and just see this vertebra is moving towards a block vertebra. So that is discospondylitis. Along with discospondylitis, you see that the vertebral bodies are fused on the ventral aspect. You see that there is lipping hair. There is lipping hair. There is lipping, bone lipping, new bone formation hair. There is bone, new bone formation hair. That lipping, ventral lipping, is not discospondylitis. That is spondylosis deformans. These two are different things. Discospondylitis is where the disc is involved, vertebral end plates are involved. Spondylosis deformans is where the ventral lipping is present on the vertebral end plates. Now, these are two completely different things. Don't confuse these two things. Both can occur together. That is a separate thing. But these are two different things, uh, totally different things, right? Discospondylitis has to be treated with antibiotics, antifungals. Uh, spondylosis has to be treated with painkillers only. Now, spondylosis basically is a result of vertebral instability. Now, uh, God has given us uh, so many small vertebrae. Why God has given us vertebrae? These small vertebrae have been given by God so that we can bend. We can bend to the left, to the right, to the forward, to the backwards. If, let us say there is no vertebral bodies, there is only a single rod. We will not be able to bend anymore, right? So uh, these vertebral bodies basically are supported with help of ligaments. On the top, dorsally, on bottom, ventrally. Now, sometimes what happens when you 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 know you lift a heavy weight or the dog jumps from a height or uh, meets an accident or uh, you know slip uh, lives on a slippery floor regularly uh, falls down regularly. Sometimes these ligaments rupture and the vertebrae become unstable. When the vertebrae becomes unstable in humans also. You go to the doctor, the doc, what doctor says? He says that you do back exercises. You do back exercises. Why? Because you want to, he wants you to build the muscles so that they will support the vertebral bodies. Now, same way in dogs, you know, exercise, exercise cannot be, uh, you know, given. Uh, uh, back exercises cannot be done. So what you do is, uh, you uh, do a hydrotherapy or uh, uh, treadmills and uh, uh, physiotherapies. Uh, there are some centers available. But if you can't do, then what God, uh, what nature does is nature will deposit new calcium, new bone, and try to fix the vertebral bodies. That is why this vertebral bodies fuse. And basically, they fuse and the two vertebrae are stabilized. So the vertebrae will not move up and down anymore. So no pinching of the nerve, so pain will go. That is how uh, you know nature works. So that ventral lifting is the spondylosis deformance. And eating up of the end plates is discospondylitis. These two are totally different things. Now this is an example of scoliosis caused by a block vertebra. You just see the vertebra is blocked. So 7, 6, 5, 4 is blocked. So L5, L4 is block vertebra, causing scoliosis, sideward deviation of the vertebral column. 
Then this is an example of spondylosis deformans. I told you there is ventral lipping. Now this lipping is from the end plates only. So you just see this lipping is on from the end plates. This is spondylosis deformans. Uh, this can be seen on uh, VD, uh, VD view as well. Lateral lipping is there. Just see this is lateral lipping on VD view. So you will see lateral and ventral lipping in spondylosis deformance. That tells you that these vertebrae are unstable. Then the next condition is wobbler syndrome. Wobbler syndrome is also called as cervical spondylopathy. Now this is seen in dogs. This is also seen in horses. Now generally C5, C6, C7 is involved. Basically these three vertebrae become unstable. And there is usually there is step up of C6, C7 or C, uh, C5, C6. So there is step up of these vertebrae. So when they step up is there, the vertebrae, uh, there, there is pinching of the uh, nerve. And when pinching of the nerve is there, neurological signs come and the dog will wobble. They, it will not be able to stand properly, not walk properly. So it will wobble. It will have a, a gait like a drunkard. So after five packs or six packs, the uh, the gait that that type of gait will be there. So cervical spondylopathy is a wobbler syndrome. Uh, the best way to diagnose confirm uh, the diagnosis is by using a myelography. So you can do a myelography. So you can uh, uh, inject uh, contrast agent uh, into the CSF. Uh, at the foramen magnum and uh, the contrast agent uh, will be seen flowing into the in the uh, spinal cord and you can see that there is pinching of the spinal cord at l6 l7 how i know this is l uh, sorry c6 c7 this is c6 and this is c7 how i know this is c6 is this ventral transverse process that tells me that this is c6 and that is c7 and that Pinching of the spinal cord at level of C6, C7 uh, is wobbler syndrome. So uh, you can diagnose wobbler syndrome. This is very common in Doberman Pinscher dogs. It can be seen in other giant breed dogs also, but Doberman Pinscher is uh, commonly affected with wobbler syndrome. Then uh, this is degenerative joint disease. I told you among the six first six points I told you, you should evaluate the articular facets. The articular facet should be neat and clean. It should be having a nice curve like this. You can see this curve. It is nice and beautiful hair, hair. But here you see that there is periosteal reaction. Here you see there is periosteal reaction. There is mild periosteal reaction here also. This is all degenerative joint disease. Now this is again very painful condition. We don't bother to evaluate the articular facets. We should evaluate the articular facets carefully if you want to know what, uh, why the pain is coming or why the dog is showing symptoms of pain. Then this, this is a condition called as diffused idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis dish. 
many times you see that the whole vertebral column is fused ventrally. Now, how this is different from spondylosis deformance is in spondylosis deformance, the lipping will limit to the vertebral end plates or cranial or caudal ends of the vertebral body. Right, but in dish, the whole vertebral body will be fused. The whole vertebral body will be fused like this. So if more than four vertebrae are fused like this, and you see that the, the vertebrae are literally fused, this is called as dish, diffused idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. So we get a lot of such cases and we overlook it, but these are the cases uh, very common see, commonly seen in boxers, but can be seen in any dog, any dog, any breed, common in boxers. And these cases will not show any symptoms. These may be an incident, incidental findings, but usually what will happen, the dog will have a restricted gait. It will walk, have a stiff walk. You see, vertebral bodies are fused, so naturally the walk will be affected. So the dog will have a stiff walk. And if the dog is showing paralysis or signs of paralysis, the cause of paralysis will be at the site where there is no fusion. This is the site where you will expect the pinching because rest are fused, so there is no chance of you know instability or pinching. So if there is instability in case of dish, the site of instability is likely to be where there is no fusion. So this is important point about dish and you should report that there is a dish or diffused idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis when you see such a such a radiograph in front of you. Then fact fractures, fractures are easy to diagnose, you know, uh, uh, just see the vertebral body is smaller than the adjacent vertebra. So usually fractures are impacted. Impacted means, uh, you know, you take a, a Coke, a, a can of Coke and just press from the top. The can will become small, but it will not break. Same thing happens with the vertebral body. It is a spongy bone. It will impact, but it will not break. So you will see such uh, a picture a small vertebral body uh, uh, as compared to its adjacent counterparts. And these are fractures of the vertebra. These are impacted fractures. Once you see an impacted fracture, do a myelography to check whether there is a, you know, a, 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 any break in continuity of the sp uh, spinal canal or there is pinching of the spinal cord or pinching of the nerves is there or not. So this is another example of fracture. Just see this. So uh, that is the uh, sacrum, that is sacrum. So this is seven, six, and this is five. Just see the vertebral end plate of fifth lumbar vertebra is fractured. Now you should be able to recognize such small fractures now and differentiate fractures from dislocations. Now fractures are when the body or the end plate is broken. Dislocation is when the vertebra is dislocated from the intervertebral disc space. So you should be careful. Sometimes after fracture, the uh, you know it, uh, the vertebral body can go up. That is not dislocation. That is a fracture. For example, see this. This is a subluxation. Just see the step up. So you, just you see this at this point. There is a step down here. So this is step up here. So that is step up and just see the intervertebral disc space that has reduced. So you know that there is a intervertebral disc prolapse as well as there is dislocation or subluxation of the vertebra. Now count the vertebra. If we count the vertebra, so presuming that this is not a transitional vertebra. So this 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 is T this is the last rib that goes and attaches to this. So this is this should be T13. This should be T13 and this should be L1. 
So L P13 and L1 is this one. Now here, if you see this particular radiograph, you can see that this is not a dislocation. This is a fracture. Now see the vertebral end plate is still in its own position. This is the vertebral end plate of this vertebra. So this vertebra is broken at the level of end plate and gone up, displaced dorsally. So this is a fracture of T13 vertebra. So T13 is fractured at the level of caudal end plate. So that is how you report in your um, you know, uh, interpretation. In your interpretation, you have to report that there is a, a fracture of caudal end plate of T13 and there is dorsal displacement of T13 vertebra. That tells you that uh, uh, the correct picture of this radiograph. Then you can do a myelography to confirm how bad it is. Nowadays CT has come, so nowadays people are uh, having uh, CT, uh, help of CT also. Then uh, vertebral tumors can also be seen. So vertebral tumors are uh, generally having a bad prognosis uh, and usually are diagnosed very late. Uh, how to diagnose vertebral tumors is, I told you, you have to check the vertebral body the integrity of the body, you should be able to see the body nicely. Uh, the dorsal, the end plates, the ventral border of the vertebra should be very clear, clearly remarkable. If you're not able to see the borders clearly, that is likely to be neoplasia or eating up of vertebral bodies. So just see here, there is a, a, a eating up of vertebral body here. And in this, there is an eating up of L7, the whole L7 is eaten up. So such such cases, you know, generally are presented very late to us. With uh, generally, owner will notice when the swelling uh, is visible on the top. And uh, sometimes these tumors invade into the uh, uh, spinal canal or pinch the uh, nerves, and then paralysis comes due to no apparent reason, no trauma. And then you take a radiograph and you find that this is invasive. Uh, you have to do a CT to confirm how bad it is, how how much it is involving the uh, spinal canal. Uh, this is this this case come came to us uh, maybe in January this this year, and uh, this was a German Shepherd dog with a, a, a huge swelling on the neck. So uh, we took this radiograph. We thought that this is an abscess. And then we took this radiograph and we found that there was lysis of the dorsal spinous process of C2. So if you see the dorsal spinous process of C2, it is showing lysis. There is lysis of this dorsal spinous process of C2. Now, uh, this was a very bad case and we did, did a, a FNAC, uh, but uh, owner did not turn a uh, turn up for uh, for um, uh, further uh, interventions. Uh, we we found that this was a tumor arising from uh, the dorsal spinous process. Now such cases come to you, and uh, 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 sometimes uh, you know trauma cases come to you and uh, you are at a loss that uh, we want to take a radiograph of cervical region or thoracic region or lumbar region or uh, uh, sacral region. So uh, you should be able to localize the lesion. So I'm not going to discuss the whole neurology today, but I'll tell you just quick tips how to localize a lesion, whether the lesion is in cervical or whether the lesion is in thoracic or it is in lumbar. So I'll just try to quickly uh, explain to you uh, how to localize the lesion. Uh, so see, uh, this is the uh, sketch of a vertebral column of a dog or a cat. You see there, there are seven cervical, 13 thoracic. Just a minute. Let me make it this so it becomes more easy. So there are seven cervical, 13 thoracic, seven lumbar, and there is S1 to S, uh, S3, which is fused, sacral. 
Now, for the purpose of localization of lesion, or the for the for purpose of neurological examination, you divide the vertebral column into four segments. So, the first segment is C1 to C5. C1 to C5 is also called a cervical segment, or C1 to C5. That is the first segment for the purpose of neurological examination. The second segment is C6 to T2. That is sixth cervical to second thoracic. Now, this is also called as the brachial plexus. This plexus supplies the foramen. The next segment is T3 to L3. So, third thoracic to third lumbar. This is the third segment. And the last segment is L4 to S3. L4 to S3 is also called as the sacral plexus. This applies to the hind limb. So, for the purpose of understanding, let me tell you a uh, few things. The first is uh, uh, C6 to T2 is the brachial plexus. It supplies to the forelimb. L, uh, L4 to S3 is the lumbosacral plexus. It supplies to the hind limbs. So, you have to, uh, you know, check the reflexes of the fore and hind limbs. So, the, I'll, I'll just tell you the tricks. Quickly, you can, you know, tell uh, which part is involved. So, there are, when you evaluate the reflexes in the forelimb and hind limbs, you have to check for patellar reflex. That is the reflex of the patellar tendon. So, what you have to do is, uh, you have to strike at the mm -hmm. patellar tendon. That is, uh, you feel the patella, palpate the patella. Just below the patella, you will feel a taut structure. That is the patellar tendon. You just strike on the patellar tendon of a dog and you will see that the limb will have give a slight jerk. That slight jerk of the limb is normal. Now, if you hit with a hammer or a pleximeter and even with your finger, if that jerk is exaggerated, that means if you strike, just, just put a simple tap and if the dog jerks the limb with a very strong uh, reaction or reflex, that is called as a upper motor neuron sign, UMN sign. Upper motor neuron signs are exaggerated responses. So remember, upper motor neuron signs are exaggerated. And if you strike the patellar tendon and no reflex is seen, that means the dog will not jerk at all. That is the lower motor reflex, LMN sign, LMN sign. So exaggerated response are UMN, lowered responses or no responses, LMN. So you have to remember these two terms, LMN and UMN. This is for the hind limb. So patellar tendon reflex is very good reflex. You should be able to uh, easily, you know, do this test using your fingers or maybe an artery forcep or maybe a pleximeter. In the forelimbs, you have to strike at the lateral aspect of the elbow. Just below the elbow, on the lateral aspect, you strike, keeping the limb in a relaxed position. So the carpal is relaxed and you just strike at the level of elbow. This is the extensor carpi radialis muscle. Now, when you strike that extensor carpi radialis, what will happen? The carpus will show a little bit of jerk. So, if you see little bit of jerk below the carpus, that means the paw will jerk. Or you can also see uh, uh, some reflexes or twitching of the shoulder joint, or sh sorry, shoulder muscles. Uh, in this particular extensor carpi radialis. Now, this is a very important response for the forelimb. So, if the responses are normal, you will see a small jerk. If it is increased upper motor neuron, you will see a very strong jerk. If it is LMN, lower motor, you will not see any jerk. So, that is how you evaluate the forelimb. For forelimbs, you can also evaluate the, uh, you know, uh, uh, triceps and biceps, but uh, I think extensor carpi uh, radialis is very easy to, uh, you know, uh, uh, evaluate. 
as compared to uh, triceps and biceps. So uh, now if if uh, UMN and um, MI, uh, LMN is clear, you have to remember three statements. The first is regions behind the lesion. When I say region means limbs. Limbs behind the lesion will always have upper motor neuron sign. So this is a very important thing. So suppose, let us say that the, there is a lesion at T9. So the limb behind the T9 is hind limb. So hind limb will always have upper motor neuron sign. If I say that there is a lesion at C3, so which limbs are behind C3? Four limbs as well as hind limbs. So four limb will also have upper motor neuron. Hind limb will also have upper motor neuron. So regions or limbs behind the lesion will always have upper motor neuron. The next is limbs cranial to the lesion will always be normal. So let us say there is a lesion at T10. OK, so if there is a lesion at T10, the hind limb will show upper motor neuron. That means exaggerated responses. The four limbs will be normal. So that is how we interpret. The third point is regions or limbs corresponding to lesion will always have element sign. So the corresponding limbs is only C6 to T2 for four limbs and L4 to S3 for hind limbs. So if there is a lesion, let us say in T1. So if there is a lesion in T1, the four limb is corresponding to that. So it will have a lower motor neuron sign. And what will happen to the hind limb? The hind limb will have a upper motor neuron. So the first line stands true for the hind limb. The second line stands true for the fore limb. Similarly, if there is a, let us say there is a lesion at L6. Okay, if there is a lesion at L6, hind limb will have element. And what about the fore limb? The fore limb will remain normal. So these three lines or these three statements should be remembered always and you will be able to get an idea that this part is involved. I'll take a radiograph of this particular part of the vertebral column. So let us say that there is a lesion between C1 to C5. OK, the first segment. So what do you expect in four limb? So in four limb, we will expect a upper motor neuron sign. The so first line, first statement, just see the first statement. In hind limb also, we'll expect a upper motor neuron sign. Suppose the lesion is in C6 to T2. So in four limb, we'll expect a lower motor, the last statement. And in hind limb, we'll have a upper motor. Similarly, if there is a lesion between T3 to L3, in four limb, we'll have normal, in hind limb will have upper motor neuron sign. And if there is a lesion between L4 to S3, the fore limb will have normal and hind limb will have lower motor neuron sign. So these all have been derived from these three statements, which I have written on the top. So once you find this, once you, you, you record these signs, LMN and UMN, you will be able to you know find out or localize the lesion and accordingly take a radiograph and do further investigations but there are two small ex exceptions there are two small exceptions the first is the shift sherrington response which is when the lesion is in t12 t13 l1 whenever there is a lesion between t13 or T12, T13, or T13, L1, then what do you expect in a hind limb? In hind limb, you will expect a upper motor neuron sign. So that is okay. But in four limb, you will expect normal. But here, the four limbs will be hyperextended. So you will see that the dog will have a hyperextended four limbs. So if you see a hyperextended four limb and upper motor neuron in hind limb, it is a shift Chennington response and your lesion should be in T12, T13, L1. 
and if the lesion is in last part of the spinal cord that is the corda equina why we call it corda equina because the spinal cord ends at about uh, l6 beyond l6 it will have uh, it will continue as nerves or fibers which look like a horse's tail that is why it is called as corda equina so the corda equina if the corda equina is involved that means beyond l6 is involved there will be loss of bladder tone and loss of anal tone so the, the dog will not, uh, not be able to control its defecation nor it will be able to control its urination so it will be dribbling urine all the time feces will also come out uh, you know without any control and if when you just touch the anus Uh, uh, the dog will not you know constrict the anus that tells you that this is corda equina corda equina is involved now if the corda equina is okay the lesion will always be cranial to l6 so these are some ways you can tell how uh, to localize the lesion how to identify which part is involved which part i will take an x ray of so these are just quick tips Uh, neurological examination is a big 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 chapter but i have just tried to um, tell you small quick tips to uh, get an idea about the lesion some some dogs or some lesions may not follow this rule but 80% of the cases will follow this rule you should be good with 80% of the cases you can assess yourself uh, you can uh, if you want uh, you can answer these questions in the comment section uh, as you wish or as the organizers want i have i have done my presentation Sir, and you can is, there are some self assessment questions, questions you have you have yes sir so i'll 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 just share the uh, share the slide and yes, uh, yes. Uh, they can respond but in but in chat box chat they can box respond can sir respond. yes uh, so this is this is the uh, first uh, radiograph so i am not able to see the chat box let me see sir minimize the main minimize screen, the main screen. And, and when you that's not yes. a problem uh, but the problem yes uh, it's not helps speed back on main screen but the problem is if he is not sharing the screen how will he be ask the question sir first of all you share the screen on the full screen uh, mode and you can uh, you can ask your question so i have uh, this is the uh, this is the radiograph you can, they can assess themselves so uh, one visible one visible thing to i can also i am expert now to <laughs> this <laughs> this problem <laughs> so what is this uh, this is this the answers are expected to be given in a chat box and we will read out chat box uh, after Hello. 1 you, minute you, of that uh, 1 minute is too long minute time, it, it, it should it should be 30 seconds 
quick, quick. Okay. 30 seconds, 30 seconds, right. Yep, yep. yep. Kanika, please start your 30 seconds time. Sir, many, most of the answers are given correct, I believe. So this is. But if you are asking, there may be some twist in that. No, 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 no twist. No twist, no twist. sir. These are, the, these are simple questions. Yeah. 30 seconds are over. Uh, this is a case of dish, doctor. Yes, correct, correct, correct. Absolutely. Yes, most of the, most of the answers. Okay, the next one. The next question is there. This dog met with an accident. Right. Telling. Don't have to speak. Please uh, write your answer in chat box only. 30 seconds time is there. So the point is that uh, uh, the uh, persons who are attending, they should know that you have to evaluate those six points which I told you. Yes, sir. Ap yes, apart sir. from the two, three points extra for each segment I told you, right? Yes, so sir. So I, I hope that uh, you should be able to diagnose this. This is a very easy diagnosis. Sir, so time is over, I believe, Kanika. Yes, yes. Uh, sir, so now you have to tell us the exact answer and then I, we will tell you the who's so the... Uh, there right is, uh, uh, this is uh, C1, C2, C3, C4, C4, C5, C5, C6, C6, C7 are, uh, the disk space is gone. So there is re reduced intervertebral disk space between C4 to C7 vertebrae. Impacted, achha, okay, there are wobbler syndrome some people have written. Yes, wobbler will be okay. Fracture of atlas, some uh, have no, written. No, fracture. That is not fracture of atlas. That is not Wobbler, fracture of. Uh, many people have written and dislocation C3. This was trauma, no? Uh, when I when I say trauma or ha I met with an accident, wobbler automatically goes away. Wobbler it is, is not C2, problem. C3 block. It's not a block. No, uh, no, no, it is not block. It is trauma, accident, after accident, right? Right. So Next you should slide, sir. see the history also. I told you, right? Now yes, this, yes, yes. so this day dog came for kyphosis. Dog came from kyphosis, kyphosis, okay. arched back, arched back. So right, only complaint right. that there is arched back. This was a pug. Okay, I was about to ask that this look like a pug. Uh, <laughs> This is a very easy case. This is a hemivertebrae, multiple. Yes, sir. But many, uh, your many students have given the right answer. Yeah, that's I great. Think, uh, great. First of all, congratulations to you, sir, and to your students also. Uh, I mean, they are, they have learned a lot from this lecture. Now, next slide is there. Okay. Thank you, sir. So there is fracture yes, of L4. There is fracture of L4 with a ventral displacement. Of the caudal caudal segment, है ना? Ventral displacement of the caudal segment. Caudal right, part, है ना? Right. Caudal part. And there is the spondylosis deformance of uh, seven, uh, four, B two, one, B third, L one, L two, I suppose, है ना? L one, L two. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. Thank you.
Okay. This is a radiograph. Uh, usually we see. This is. A... Yes. This is a very common. This came in February. This to us. This dog was not able to walk properly. Pain, having pain in the hand. Yes. So sometimes it is without any symptoms also. Yes, yes. Many times. Many times the dog will not show at all any symptoms, but uh, yes. you you may find spondylosis deformance. Yeah. So this is a spondylosis yes. deformance. Yes, yes. Many, 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 many. So you have to write right which which vertebrae are involved, right? Yes, yes. yes. The next slide is there. Slices of lumbar vertebrae. Sir, don't have to say, just write your answer in your chat box, please. So this this is a discospondylitis involving five L six and vertebral and plates. There are yes. multiple multiple systolates also, multiple urethrolates yes. also. Yes. So multiple yes. multiple bladder stones also and urethral stones also. Right. Yes. Right. This is a cat, I suppose. Next question is there. So uh, this 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 was a cat, I suppose, if I'm not wrong. And uh, this came for uh, animal was not passing stools. OK, no, no history of trauma. <clears throat> Few right answers are there. So there is a block vertebra. Yes, there's a block vertebra here. Anna. You can see the block vertebra here. L5, L6. Yeah, L5, L6. Perfect. And this dog came for a PD pregnancy diagnosis. They wanted to count the number of fetus. Pug. OK, again. So I want to know the number of fetus as well as the vertebral co column, the problem oh. in the vertebral column. So two assignments. <laughs> so that we'll discuss an abdomen sometime else. There are multiple uh, hemivertebrae. Yes. Crowding of yes. crowding of ribs is there. Yes. And there are at least four fetal skeletons. At least four fetus. Yes. Four heads are visible. Yes. At least four fetal skeletons. Yes. Right. So thank you very much. That's great, so, sir. Some people were asking some questions, and mm -hmm. uh, now you can uh, close down your main screen. And you can come to the main screen, sir. Then you will be able to access the chat box also along with this chatting. You stop sharing, sir. Yes, sir. So now if you see on your top, uh, there is a where multiple. There is a tray. So first option is chat. You can open the chat, sir, on your screen. And there are some questions people uh, just mentioned in between. So anybody who wants to ask any question, they can ask right now. Uh, excuse me, sir. My chat box is not working. Can I ask you a question on uh, this chat? Uh, sure, sure, sure. Globally? Please, you can, you can. Uh, sir, I just want to know how can we differentiate between a hemivertebrae and an impacted fractures and size is reduced in both of them. So, see, uh, history that that is why I told you history should go along. So you okay. should, you you should uh, see the history properly. Yeah. So uh, if history is there that there is trauma and the dog uh, or recent accident and the dog is showing symptoms. 
right? So it is likely to be impacted fracture. If it is the uh, toy breed dog, I told you the breeds which are commonly involved with hemivertebrae. Then uh, uh, and their dog is moving around fine, no history of trauma. It is likely to be hemivertebra. Thank you. Right? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. There are certain questions in harness. Sir, can you read it? Sir, are you able to see the chat box now? Yes, yes, yes. Sir. There are multiple questions, sir. Please. So. Let me start from the big, beginning. Uh, Upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron, Dr. Few uh, vets are asking. Upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. Hmm. Uh, they want to know the details again. So uh, I will, I will, I, I will explain again. No, no problem. I'll explain in the end. Huh? Give me some time. I'll see the other questions first. Uh, Okay. In Horner syndrome, what abnormality we can see in neck radiograph? We may not see anything on red neck radiograph. Basically, Horner syndrome can be due to avulsion of brachial plexus. The avulsion of brachial plexus can lead to Horner syndrome, but you may not see anything in neck region. It is not necessary that you will find a radiographic lesion in neck region. But if you see a lesion in brachial plexus, then uh, Horner syndrome can accompany. It is not necessary that it will uh, uh, be always, uh, you will find a lesion, right? So C6 to T2 will be involved in brachial plexus evolution. The brachial plexus segment I told you, right? Should we go for intertubular for spondylosis deformance? Uh, no, only symptomatic, just painkillers and rest, nothing else. What is the position? And of course, uh, if you have a physiotherapy facility for physiotherapy, you can go for physiotherapy. Uh, uh, sir, what is the position of animal body for patellar and extensor carpi? So uh, you have to see the patellar reflex uh, in lateral recumbency with the effect, uh, with the limb being evaluated uppermost. So let us say you are evaluating the right limb. So you should place the animal in left lateral recumbency. So right limb will be uppermost and then you can just tap the patella or extensor carpi radialis. So affected, uh, sorry, evaluated to be evaluated limb should be uppermost. So do you give online courses in radiology? No. Uh, uh, what is the fixation technique that you are using to stabilize vertebral fractures? Plating can be done. Transfixation can be done. Can you please comment on lumbosacral stenosis or diagnosis and treatment? Um, I have not. I, I'm not included. You can uh, personally contact me. I can give you this answer. Huh? Uh, sir, how to calculate VHS in dog? Oh, this is not we will not calculate. Ha, we will not be able to calculate. In kyphosis, we will not never calculate VHS. Uh, what is the treatment of dish, sir? No, no treatment for dish. It, it is usually an incidental finding. Uh, uh, common in boxers and uh, you can't do anything about it. How to differentiate between uh, the neoplasia and discospondylosis? Spondylitis based on X-ray. Uh, discospondylitis will typically involve the vertebral end plates. Neoplasia will generally involve the body of the vertebra. So that that is the difference. Atlanto occipital giants, any significant? No. Atlanto occipital giant, no. So treatment of discospondylitis and spondylosis. Discospondylitis needs to be treated with antibiotics or antifungal, depending on what kind of infection is there. You have to isolate the bacteria and CST, and accordingly, antibiotics or antifungal has to be. Uh, given. But you have to first confirm what is the reason. Antlanto occipital joint, any significance meaning? No, I can't tell you. Please quickly describe the RDS interpretation of IOD type 1 and type 2. Intervertebral disc Hansen type 1 
in hansen type 1 what happens is the i will just tell you broadly uh, in hansen's type 1 the annulus fibrosus breaks and the nucleus pulposus goes into the spinal cord and pinches the spinal cord but hansen's type 2 there is herniation of the annulus fibrosus so that means breakage nahi hoti annulus fibrosus goes up herniates into the spinal cord and compresses it compression is seen in both the conditions but in hansen type 1 annulus fibrosus ruptures in hansen type 2 annulus fibrosus protrudes into it. but it does not rupture matlab weak ho jata hai it weakens but protrudes into in spinal cord uh, treatment is more or less the same you have to decompress so do a, a dorsal a laminectomy or hemi laminectomy or ventral slot whatever you are comfortable with do you recommend physiotherapy complete rest in case of vertebral disc disease vertebral disc disease we will recommend complete rest followed by after the dog starts walking slow physiotherapy initially complete rest cage rest is recommended how to diagnose myelitis myelitis osteomyelitis discospondylitis the same thing na is there any treatment for wobblers yes uh, they stabilize the uh, we don't do it but uh, in western countries they stabilize c5 c6 c7 with uh, plating or Uh, stabilizers are there. Vertebral stabilizers are there. So stabilize. Doctor Hamish Shah is writing again and again and again. Atlanta occipital joint. Any significance? Please meaning, answer. What What is meaning of that? Ah, we are unable to understand. What What do you mean by Atlanta occipital joint? Any significance means you want to ask any uh, abnormality associated with that or what? Because Atlanto, the question is not clear. Atlanta occipital joint is very strong joint. It will not dislocate easily. and if it dislocates you don't have any treatment for that basically atlanto occipital joint is uh, uh, very strong joint actually i don't know uh, what he wants to ask what is the role of conscious proprioception assessment of lameness no no, no beyond my that. what is the prognosis of vertebral transfixation procedure variable progress depends on how quickly you do the surgery uh, if if the uh, case is uh, dealt with very early you can have a good uh, uh, prognosis and is significant corticosteroids in paraplegia due to vertebralization and also how to calculate dose and total this is beyond biomechanical forces oh oh treatment protocol for paraplegia i can you please share shared in the high sir can you please okay so more or less i have answered most of the questions uh, last i have uh, one question is there how do we treat a trace of case of corda equina damage with the lost bladder tone due to trauma aage kya chance of animal regain back back bladder tonicity uh, depends on how bad the trauma is uh, i have seen cases recovering also with treatment steroids are to be given and uh, bladder uh, 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 this uh, what is that uh, what is the medicine i am not able to recollect the name of the medicine which increases the bladder tone i bethanicol 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 yeah. bethanicol ha uh, urocol or bethanicol is given yes 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 sir can you show us any transfix vertebra sir can you remove the appendix or not or baat kar raha treatment part I'm, uh, i am i would like to avoid i am uh, concern uh, basically presenting on radiography so yes. bahut treatment ka puch rahe hain so i will not uh, answer that lm and uh, umn i will just explain again 
I will just share the slide again. I hope that uh, you will be able to understand. There was a last question. If lesions in uh, junction T2, chances of quadriplegic? Uh, yes, quadriplegia is there. Uh, there is chance of quadriplegia. Yes, definitely. So I think we, with this, we should end this session. Uh, Dr. Saab has already uh, given a lot of time to us, and uh, we are very much thankful from core of our heart that he has given us time. And on this common platform, I would request him to again spare. I know he's getting, uh, these days he's very busy and some family things are also there. So we would be expecting whenever Dr. Saab is free next time, we will have another session on different topics. So those people who were asking about the online uh, education program, stay connected with us. DocSub is always there to help us. So he will be coming again and again on this platform in a month's time or uh, whenever he is free. But definitely we are going to cover the whole radiology with DocSub only. So thank you with this, sir. Thank you very much for your precious time. It has been a very wonderful session, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you all for listening and having patience to listen to me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Have a Thank great you. Sunday. Thank you.